Here is Daniel Gruenberg. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Thailand. Thank you uh, to the ICCF organizers and the Anthropocene Institute for inviting me. So today uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Leonard calorimetry and a little bit of uh, history and what uh, some recent developments. Um, I will introduce uh, a few results from external validations and then update you on, on what we're doing now and um, what we found to be the irrelevance of COP in some cases. And then in the end, I'll put it all together, what it means um, for future developments. So first of all, um, what you see here, these are two temperature profiles of uh, legacy reactors. On the left, uh, you can see th these are stainless steel uh, reactors that are wrapped with the uh, resistance wire. Uh, which are the source of heating. On the left, you will see the temperature profile gives a fairly normal uh, distribution of a non-excess uh, heat producing reactor where it's hottest in the middle and the temperature reduces towards both ends. Um, on the right-hand side, we see that uh, a profile where the distribution is not even. Um, so this beg some questions. Um, what What is the cause of the uneven heating? Is it a Lenner reaction? Could it be something else? Um, and, and just to give some context to this, Mizuno's data shows a temperature dependent reaction rate. It's an, it, it's an exponential function uh, of excess heat output versus temperature. So could small variations in temperature um, be producing variable results. Would the proximity to the heating wire within a few millimeters, if, if, a, if an NAE, a nuclear active environment, is close proximity to the heating wire, would that cause um, some variability from experiment to experiment, from researcher to researcher? Um, this was a question that we came to to ask. Um, now, I um, apologize for the, uh, we cannot read this slide uh, very well, but I'll try and get through this. So legacy calorimetry, uh, Professor Mizuno did a lot of work with airflow calorimetry. Um, and this illustration uh, is trying to show a point that, you know, there, there's a lot of things going on here. Um, we're assuming we have a temperature dependent uh, heat source and the room temperature air coming into the box is removing heat from the reactor where we have a heat source within the calorimeter that's heating the reactor. There's a catalyst inside and the heat is moving from outside the reactor to the inside, and then uh, there's a reaction going on and heat uh, is coming out and the warmed air is removed from the surface. So um, with all these variables going on, the calorimeter actually becomes part and parcel of the reactor itself because the reaction is temperature dependent, depending on if you're removing uh, a certain amount of heat. Now that that airflow could be concentrated uh, on one section of the reactor and not another, which in uh, in a certain uh, replication, a certain scientist may have an NAE uh, right where the air is flowing. Some may have it in another location. Um, and then measuring the, the calorie uh, flow we have to measure two temperatures and a mass airflow rate. And at the very least, uh, we've got three uncertainties here, um, which are going to add together. And the signal to noise ratio can be quite low. We have found that by taking the same reactor and measuring under airflow calorimetry, and then putting it 
in a different type of reactor, which I'm going to introduce uh, in the next slide, we have found that uh, in certain cases, the airflow calorimetry could not find the excess heat, uh, whereas the incubator type uh, calorimeter was able to find it. Um, so there's a lot of variables that are not controlled well in the previous type of air flow calorimetry. Now this slide just simply describes what incubator type calorimetry is. And basically uh, this is well fit for Lenner type reactions. Now we're not doing a chemical reaction uh, calorimetry or a bomb calorimeter would be appropriate. Um, part of the challenge has been to find uh, the appropriate type of calorimetry. And just to outline what we, what we have in the graph on the left here is uh, we have a heat source. We know how much power is going into the heat source. That's very easy to control and measure. Um, and then we have a reactor inside. We usually have uh, some kind of a fan to make sure there's no differences uh, at, at physical locations within the incubator. Um, and then the losses eventually, as the unit uh, as system heats up, um, you're going to get increased uh, losses. And eventually uh, the losses are going to equal the inputs and you're going to have an equilibrium temperature. And when we calibrate uh, a system according to this method, uh, we find that the uh, R squared regressions have very, you know, more than 99%. Uh, and we, we have very clean data. So this is an example uh, of an external validation data done by an auto parts company in Japan. Um, and you have the blue dots here. These are the calibration dots. So uh, on the left, you have temperature. Uh, on the vertical scale, on the horizontal scale, we have watts. And what we find here is that as we added more wattage, there's a curve um, that shows uh, a, a relationship between the given input power and what the final equilibrium temperature was. The green dots are the same instrument, but containing an active reactor. Um, you can see there are four thermocouples uh, placed at different locations within the, the this is actually a mo uh, modified muffle furnace. Uh, the heating wires in the center there, there's four thermal couples and a mixing fan. And um, the uncertainties in, in both the X and Y directions are, are far less than 1%. So the data here has a very high certainty factor. And what we found, this isn't a, a particularly wonderful uh, case of data, but it's what we had available in time uh, for this show. Uh, it gave a COP of 1.08, but more importantly, we have 50 watts of excess heat. Um, since the catalyst had about 250 square centimeters uh, of active surface area, uh, it works out to be about 0.2 watts per square centimeter. And we feel right now that that uh, surface area is proportional to output. Uh, and we are now building uh, reactors to to test that hypothesis. So what's next uh, in in the lab for us? So we are now building um, a different type of reactor, which um, first of all has significantly higher um, specific surface area of the catalyst. We're looking at four square meters or forty thousand square centimeters of surface area per plate. We can add plates just like a heat uh, plate and frame heat exchanger as we need more heat. Um, and this uh, design will also allow us, uh, it's something that if we get useful heat out of it, not only is it going to be a much higher magnitude, um, but it may be something that we can put into useful form and actually build uh, a steam generator, uh, for example. And um, theoretically, we can using that same output we got from the previous slide, um, 
we can get about eight kilowatts of thermal per plate. So if we have between, depending on the dependency of converting heat to electricity, um, between three and six plates of something the size of uh, a notebook computer um, could produce between eight and 16 kilowatts of electricity and demand uh, continuously for years on a small charge. Um, and these units could easily power small uh, combined heat and power units for, for home use. These prototypes are currently under construction. Um, within the next two months, we expect or hope to be able to, to start testing. Um, so why do we call our technology a heat amplifier? Um, other Lenner or fusion technologies, um, hot fusion, especially uh, some other Lenner reactions as well, require electrical inputs to make pulses, to do um, various things to, to cause the reaction to occur. In this case, the COP is highly relevant uh, when you're using uh, electrical power. Um, MTI's heat M technology is unique in that it's simply a temperature dependent reaction. There is no electrical input required whatsoever. Once it reaches operating temperature, the excess heat can be removed for doing work. Um, and we have had reactors that Misano has built uh, running in our lab for almost four years, um, producing excess heat uh, without stopping, without refueling. So it's quite incredible um, what we see is, is possible. And since uh, uh, previous, previous generation technologies, we've been able to improve the reliability of the reaction to 100%. Um, once we use the improved calorimetry, uh, every time we heat the thing up, we find excess heat. Um, The economics of such a system are, are quite unique in that it, as I just previously explained, um, the hydrogen refueling frequency is, is years. Um, so it takes very tiny amounts of hydrogen to produce this heat. Um, the new generation reactors requires no precious metals. So we don't use any palladium, any platinum. Um, we feel the manufacturing process would be amenable to mass production. Um, there's a few specialized processes, but we can borrow technology from other existing industries uh, to make that happen. And if the hypothesis holds true that the 0.2 watts per square centimeter, um, if we can manage that to achieve that in a high uh, surface area design, it means that we can scale this technology from centralized generation plants um, to private home uh, combined heat and power, and possibly in terms of energy density and mass uh, efficiency, um, on paper anyway, it looks possible to do uh, something for automotive trucking, shipping, and, and these types of mobile applications. Um, we don't claim to be experts on, on flight, but a back of the napkin um, uh, calculation does show that we might even be able to, to have enough power density for flight, but it depends on, on what system you use to extract the heat. Um, and there's some technology, for example, we, we feel supercritical CO2 or something like this would be available as a, a medium to extract the heat and convert it into um, usable work. Uh, and some of this technology is still under development. So we think that that might be a little bit um, too far out in the future. So just to summarize things, um, I apologize that this is quite brief, but we have a short uh, window to do this presentation. I want to leave time for questions. Um, progress is being made. Um, the technology is moving forward. Um, we do have some external validations, which I've introduced in this talk. There are other, as uh, a major electronics manufacturer with an excellent engineering team that's doing 
the validations um, as we speak. Um, the working hypothesis now is that there's a proportional uh, amount of excess heat uh, uh, that is proportional to the surface area of the catalyst. And there's an exponential relationship between the working temperature uh, and the excess heat output. If these hypotheses are, are proven true in next generation devices, which we're building, it would mean that this system is quite easy to scale. We just need to improve surface area and there are different known ways of doing that. Um, challenges, yes, um, now that we're pushing the limits of this operation, um, especially the, trying to increase the power density by increasing temperature is a really good way of, of producing more heat but you run into problems with oxidation and uh, different issues with the materials and metals uh, being used. Um, we will need to develop uh, more controlled production methods. Everything now is handmade um, by a small team of, of engineers. Um, and we feel that the production of that will be uh, a necessary step as we go forward here. And um, just want to mention that this year we have a goal of being able to produce uh, continuous steam output. Uh, I think it's well understood in engineering, mechanical engineering fields. Once you've got high pressure steam, uh, you can do useful work with that, whether it be heating or spinning a turbine or, or moving a piston or whatnot. Um, so we believe it's a very critical step uh, to get this steam made and to be able to dem demonstrate that technology. Unfortunately, it wasn't in time uh, for this very important ICCF 24 show, um, but we're heads down and we're working hard and we're trying to get that done. And that's my talk. Yeah, I got a question. Uh very impressive uh, uh, and kind of unique in that you've got uh, your trigger is is heat heat that's correct. triggers the uh, it, it sounds kind of autocatalytic is there some way you modulate that back I mean if you've got an operating temperature up to 700 centigrade why doesn't it explode Would... um yeah, control is something that we're we're investing a lot of uh, development work into right now. Um, it, it essentially we have two a primary and a secondary loop, like some uh, nuclear uh, fission reactors operate. So as long as we we have a variable speed um, in the primary loop, and we can remove. Uh, not only excess heat, but we have additional cooling capacity. So if we need less output, we essentially remove more heat, lower the temperature of the return line uh, of the primary loop um, that will let the system come down in capacity. Uh, when we need to increase, we, we allow that temperature to rise up. So the controls uh, strike a balance between excess heat output and, and what we're removing uh, if we need to slow the reaction down more, there's extra cooling capacity uh, on that loop. Essentially, we just inject more water uh, to make more steam, and that uh, cools the, the primary loop down, and the controls are able to, to, to manage that. Um, why it doesn't explode, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be um, this generation of reactor, which we're developing now, um, I think the next step will be a, a critical um, step in trying to answer that question. Um, basically, you know, how, how thick can the plates be? We're just guessing right now. Um, will, will the temperature within the plates, if we're not removing it well enough, um, will it be hot enough to melt the catalyst in the center of the unit? That question, I don't know. If that's the case, um, experience will prove to us what we need to do and we'll make a thinner plate um, and, and be able to control that more. This is a little bit of uh, uh, trial and error, 
uh, type development work we need to do as we move forward. Thank you. Daniel, we have time for one more question. Go ahead. Hi, Daniel. Alan Smith. Hi. Hi, uh, Alan. <laughs> the, um, the whole emphasis of your work here seems to be on keeping the reactor domain within it completely isothermal. Um, am I correct? For the calorimetry, yes. Yeah, that's right. And so many LENR systems seem to respond to heat flow. In other words, where there's a hot spot and a cold spot and so on. Um, mm. Yet this doesn't seem to be a problem to you. Um, have you had any experience of heat flow systems and seen any differences in the behavior? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of touched upon that early on in, in the presentation that originally we thought like you did, and, and um, Mizuno had went through several uh, design iterations of the reactor where he put the heat uh, uh, inside the, the uh, reactor itself, and then we wrapped wires around it. And coincidentally, we had uh, Professor Muto from Hokkaido Science University try this incubator um, style calorimetry. And what we saw was the, the signal to noise ratio, everything kind of smoothed out beautifully. Um, so we're familiar with the hypothesis that you're mentioning, but in practice, what we found empirically was that these uh, even temperatures, and, and it may be, um, you know, we're, we're trying to achieve two different things. One is trying to actually measure the calorimetry. The other is to try and promote the reaction. But um, since the, the previous airflow calorimetry uh, with the wire wrapped around it was so noisy and the variability is so high, some signal was being lost in, in the noise. Um, so at the very least, we see a lot less noise under this system. There's a lot of things going on. A lot of variables smooth out over time, and, and we get very clean, very, our R squareds are, are more than 99%. Um, and and the, the standard deviation of each point is very small. But I, I really cannot answer your question. We, we have to design an experiment to specifically answer, um, you know, only change one variable and use different heating methods and see if we can find some difference. Um, so. Um, I, I think th there are questions that uh, definitely remain. We need to um, continue to, to do the research and, and answer these questions. Thank you for that very good question, Alan. Oh, thank you, yeah. So little time, so many experiments. This is a story yes, of exactly. LANR. Thank you. <laughs> you and I know those words quite well. <laughs> thank you very much, Daniel. Yes, thank you everyone for, for coming and, and listening.